Hey everyone, welcome to our fourth virtual water safety jam session. We had more people join us each week and uh, the ratings continue to climb in our satisfaction follow-up surveys. And uh, we're really looking forward to today's. I'm Jamie Ratcliffe, Executive Director of the Great Lakes Water Safety Consortium. We're a community of best practice, a community with hundreds of people from all eight Great Lakes states in Ontario working together to help people safely enjoy the water in the Great Lakes area. As more than a bit of a science guy, I'm super geeked about this week's jam session on translating science into better forecasts and warnings to reduce risk. We have had similar sessions at our in-person conferences over the years, and we're mashing them up together today with the help of two of our all-star water safety rock stars. Guy Meadows, a wave and current research scientist from the Great Lakes Research Center at Michigan Tech, and Bob Dukesherer, senior forecaster for the National Weather Service. I met both of them at my first water safety event back in 2013, and we've been friends ever since. Uh, they're not only super smart, but they're really great guys and incredibly dedicated and committed to our vision of ending drowning in the Great Lakes. So before I turn it over to Guy and Duke, um, I will ask that you post any questions that you have in the Q&A um, and any comments that you have or answers to their questions um, in the chat area or in the comment section if you're on Facebook Live. So with that, I am thrilled to turn it over to Guy Meadows. All right. Well, everyone, it's it's an absolute pleasure to be here. This is is something we all take very serious. Um, I got started in in working in nearshore hydrodynamics very early. I was I was a cook in the dorm during my sophomore year at uh, Michigan State, um, and was talking to another fellow engineering student who was also a competitive swimmer, and he goes, "You know, I'm working for this professor that." It's looking for swimmers to set instruments in big waves. And I said, they pay money for that? And he said, yeah, yeah. So I quit my job as a, as a cook in the dorm and I went to work for this professor. And as they say, it all turned into uh, to history. So once I, I got a taste of working on beaches and trying to understand the complex nature of, of the near shore zone, I was hooked for life. So uh, not only worked in the Great Lakes, but worked on the on the ocean, did a lot of work out at the uh, field research facility of the Army Corps of Engineers at Duck, North Carolina, out on the Outer Banks. And uh, coming in one day with that same guy that uh, we've been lifelong friends to that got me uh, working for that professor. We were coming in from setting instruments, uh, ran our Zodiac up on the beach in some pretty big waves and actually found uh, essentially a rip current to, to ride in on uh, because the waves were a little bit lower there because of the wave current interaction. We started to pull our dive gear out of the boat and we both looked over and saw two kids on a little raft uh, being blown out to sea and caught in that ripped current. And then about 20 meters behind them was mom about waist deep in the water trying to, to run after them. So we had no, uh, no verbal communication. We just both looked at each other and said, can't let that happen. And uh, went out there and, uh, brought all three of them back in and, and went on about unloading our, uh, our Zodiac. And about a month later, we got a notice from the Army Corps of Engineers that uh, we had a citation for patriotic service. So it was kind of a interesting thing, but, but it really got us involved in how important it is to understand nearshore dynamics. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how we might be able to use data that is readily available. Um, this has the, been the work of, of NOAA um, in terms of numerical wave modeling across the Great Lakes. Uh, both Bob and I are gonna concentrate in central Lake Michigan today uh, in the area around Holland, Michigan. So this is an example on the right-hand side of in red pen, the, uh, the numerical forecast for the entire year of 2018 for, for wave heights. And you can see the wave heights rise up to, you know, in, in maximum cases, even over four meters. And then in black, superimposed on that, uh, that starts uh, in the third panel there, superimposed over the red is the buoy observations from 
the Holland nearshore buoy 45029 uh, that's put in place by Limnotech. Um, and you can see that the agreement is phenomenally good between the numerical forecasts and the actual observations in the places where we have buoys. And this is true for all the coastal buoys around the Great Lakes. They do a tremendous job of, of, of recording wave data. Many of us use that daily, but I wanted to bring out the point how well it re, re agrees with numerical forecasts of waves. And down in the lower right-hand corner is that statistical plot. Um, and it has a correlation coefficient of 0.94. So essentially we have a numerical virtual buoy in every grid square that the forecasts happen. And on Lake Michigan, that's every two kilometer square. So if you were in Holland, for example, um, and you wanted to know precisely what the waves have been and what they will be uh, going into the future for the next few days, what you simply need to do is go to your friendly local National Weather Service forecast office and for the area around central Michigan, that's Gaylord, Michigan, and, and Bob can, can talk a little bit more about that. Click on the map, as you see in the right-hand side, um, and it actually, this program goes in and actually looks at the numerical wave forecast and then puts that out for you uh, in the daily forecast. And I did this yesterday. So for today, Wednesday, south, southeast winds around six knots becoming variable less than five knots in the afternoon, sunny, waves one foot or less. So essentially we all have a buoy in our box. So I'd like to encourage everyone to use this tremendous feature developed jointly by NOAA and the National Weather Service. Um, and it's just a, a, a tremendous tool for understanding and knowing what you might expect along your particular beach or your particular area of interest. I've stolen a, a slide from last week's presentation by, by Matt Warner. Uh, he made an excellent point that I think is worth repeating. And with the tremendously high water levels throughout the Great Lakes and the really strong storms that we've been experiencing with, with tremendous wave energies, we have a lot of excess sand in the nearshore region. And it's the sandbars that, that allow rip currents to to, uh, to create channels and create really fast flows through those sandbars. So be aware that there's an excess of sand in the surf zone right now. It's highly mobile sand. Uh, it shifts under your feet and it's very conducive to the formation of, of rip currents and other dangerous near shore currents. And I'd like to, to also give you an example here of um, some recent data that we we're able to catch, um, trying to use very simple uh, instrumentation and processes so that this can be replicated in other places. So on the left, uh, we're using a small portable drone. Uh, our main uh, target here is, is oranges. They make wonderful drift floats. They're biodegradable and they're edible. Uh, so it's a, a, a good thing to throw into the water if, if you need to get an idea how strong the currents are. And then the object on the right is a new type of current meter. It's called a tilt current meter. It's a uh, lead weight connected to this rod with a very flexible string. And inside the rod is a bunch of electronics um, and accelerometers and tilt meters uh, and a battery pack and an SD card. So this provides ex very nice measurements of current velocity, both magnitude and direction. Um, the direction is by which way this tilts uh, and there's a compass inside and the velocity is measured by the angle of the tilt. These will operate at uh, sample periods of one second for well over a year without changing batteries. So they're tremendous little instruments, they're very cheap a couple hundred dollars a piece. So it's something that we use extensively for, for getting these types of measurements in the, in the active surf zone. So we were able to catch a, a very nicely developed rip here on Lake Superior at, near the village of Autrain. 
and it's probably one of the prettiest beaches uh, anywhere in the Great Lakes, in my humble opinion. Um, our train is a is is separated by two headlands, uh, both on the east and west side, rocky headlands, um, and it's a, a a bay that is a has a large sediment supply from the off drain river and tremendous beautiful sand beaches. Uh, it's also unfortunately been been the site of, of at least one drowning and perhaps more um, being kind of a horseshoe shaped bay. Uh, it's, it's very equivalent, but much smaller than Monterey Bay, California, which is notorious for for rip currents. In fact, the Navy's big experiments on on measuring rip currents were all done in Monterey Bay because the shape of that bay is very conducive to forming rip currents. And the same is true for Autrain Bay here on Lake Superior. So you see a really nice developed uh, rip current here uh, going out at, a, at an angle across the second bar and then making a real sharp right hand turn and essentially delivering uh, whatever it's uh, transporting uh, into the deep water between the second and third bar, which is a very treacherous place to be. The black dot in the in the center of the image is me. Um, and uh, I'm sure most of us here have heard Jamie's story, but um, in, in Jamie's uh, really excellent account of, of his encounter with rip currents, he talks about the moonwalk where you try to walk towards back to shore um, and can't do it because of the strength of the current. And uh, that happened to me here where we were putting instruments in and it's just a bizarre, eerie feeling. And, and again, it's, it's very unnerving to, to not be able to go in the direction you want because of the currents. But we, were, uh, we launched some of those oranges out there and the numbers you see, one, two, three, four, five, six are, are different time-lapse positions of the, of the orange drifters. The further the numbers and dots are apart, the faster the, the flow is in those particular areas. So they were, we recorded their velocity at, at uh, equal time increments. So you see, once you're delivered out to that 90 degree turn, uh, the velocity picks up very, very fast between number two and three and between number three and four. And this is what those, those velocities look like. So, as we get out to number two, the velocity is three quarters of a meter per second, um, which is, is a very high, high speed, drops to 0 0.6, 0 0.4, and so on. So these velocities are, are things that, that you're gonna have a really hard time swimming against. So keep in mind, even on a relatively mellow day, like we are seeing here, that these, these velocities are, are really something to be contended with. If you also look at the times between that, um, to go that whole roller coaster ride from, from at the second bar where the waves are breaking out and down, down the beach a good 50 meters or so, that whole thing takes on the order of 30 or 40 seconds. So it's a very fast ride and, and could be, as I say, very unnerving and something we, we all need to, need to pay a lot of attention to. The tilt, Current meters that I told you about to provide uh, data over several days are where the uh, green and yellow circles are. So one of those is placed far offshore and two were placed right in that channel. But rather than focusing on the velocities, I would like you to look down through these panels. The upper one is, is day one on uh, September 17th. The second one is day two on the 18th. And the third one is day three on on the 19th, so one day apart. But notice how the rip channel in all of its characteristics maintaining the same shape is migrating down the beach. It's moving from left to right. The, uh, the two in the upper panel, the two tilt current meters in green were right in the rip channel when we put them in. The rip channel moved further to the, to the east and the sandbar starts encroaching. And by the third day, the sandbar is over top of the tilt current meters and it took us most of another day to dig them out and find them. So it's, uh, it's something that, that's a little scary about rip currents is you could be in a place uh, where there is no rip current and one could certainly migrate during the period of the time you're at the beach to where you are. So a safe position becomes an unsafe position. We also have a 
small jet ski uh, outfitted with a bottom mapping sonar, perfect for, for working here in, in shallow water. And you can see the complexity of the of the flow of the, the bottom topography around the rip current. And that maintains itself in all three of these images, um, but just gets translated down the shoreline. So the rip looked exactly the same, no changes in its width or depth or or its offshore extent. It just moves down the shoreline as a as an ultimate unit, which again points to the fact, although we know a fair things about rips and how they form and how they behave and their their magnitude and strength and the types of ways it takes to kick them off. Um, we don't know everything. There's some still mysteries about the topology of the rip current and, and how it behaves. And, and, and we have a lot to learn still from, from nature. So I want to plant some questions for you to think about, and I'm going to turn it over to Bob here in a minute. But you know, what do we do with this type of information? How can we use this to reduce drownings? What actions can we take as a group? Is there more or different information that we need in order to move forward? Uh, if so, we need to know what that is and you know, are we, are we doing enough? So think about those and we'll come back to this at the end of the presentation and engage you all in, in trying to decide where we go from here. So thank you very much, I, I appreciate it. Let's have okay. some applause in the chat room for Guy while Bob's loading his slides. That was a great, great presentation. So much interesting stuff to think about. And um, it's just fascinating all the work you've been doing over the years, how it keeps improving and you keep getting better and better data from all your high tech equipment and, and your scientific methods. And uh, we just can't thank you enough for being on all this for us. Duke, you ready to go? All right. Um... So I'll, I'll just give you a little background on, on how and why I'm in this. Um, so I, I grew up in a beach town on, on the Lake Michigan shore. I, I grew up in St. Joseph. Uh, I was on the swim team as a kid for St. Joe. And one of my classmates in grade school drowned in Lake Michigan uh, at Silver Beach. So that was my first foray into this. Uh, I moved away to California to another beach town in Southern California took up bo boogie boarding there, still do that today in Lake Michigan. Um, and in my career, I, I've been in the National Weather Service now for almost 30 years. And most of that time here in Grand Rapids and most of that time as the Marine Program Manager here. So I've seen uh, and, and looked into a number of drownings uh, through the last 25 years that I've sat in Grand Rapids as the Marine Program Manager. We're responsible for areas from St. Joseph to Manistee. So a lot of pristine beaches, a lot of people on those beaches and, and a lot of drownings, unfortunately. So I'm very committed to the cause of the, the Water Safety Consortium, which is to try to eliminate or at least trend down the amount of drownings. Uh, so a recent event over in Holland where two kids drowned uh, a weekend ago is it's kind of the impetus be behind this presentation. Um, so at the end of it, I'm going to ask some harder questions as to where we can redouble our efforts and, and what we can do to try to re reduce drownings in the Great Lakes. So to, to go into my presentation, the first thing I want to show is Holland, Michigan put in a new webcam about three or four weeks ago. I, I was originally asked uh, by folks in Holland uh, that I've worked on other webcam endeavors, whether or not they could put a webcam on my my gauge house on the pier. And I let them know that it's not my gauge house, but I, I know the people that own it, another entity in NOAA, the, the National Ocean Service. So I got them in contact with each other and they ended up putting in a, a really high tech webcam. It's a pan tilt zoom cam. It can move uh, 360 degrees uh, around the compass. Uh, the first 10 minutes of every hour, it's pointed at the beach in Holland. And, and you, can, you can see this, the website there uh, is in my presentation. Uh, you, you can just Google the city of Holland webcams and you find these. Uh, they've got seven or eight across the town. Uh, this is a really great cam. So the National Ocean Service partnered with the city of Holland and they're going to try to post process uh, the data to see what goes on on a daily basis there with currents to try to identify rip currents and probably the, the bigger issue at Holland structural currents that, that move out along the pier. So some of that post-processing I'll show you in, in these next couple of slides. 
This is something that a colleague of mine in the National Ocean Service that I've worked on other projects with him, Dr. Greg Dusek. Uh, he's based out of Washington, DC, does some work down in North Carolina. This is a machine learning approach that is detecting rip currents based on it's trained, the model is trained to look at static images and video and, and determine where a rip current is. And the bounding box is giving you the percentage that a rip current is in that box. So obviously this is a pretty obvious rip current with water flowing offshore. You can see the, the foam moving uh, seaward. Uh, you know, so it's, it's doing a pretty good job there. The interesting thing will be how this works in the Great Lakes with our much more chaotic sea state on, on the ocean. Uh, wave periods are, you know, 10 to 15 seconds. You can steady for the next wave. In the Great Lakes, it's a washing machine. So it may have a harder time picking up on these things, but we will see as we go forward. This is another thing they're using, uh, optical flow tracking. It's essentially a, a line of virtual buoys that they put on the image and, and then the flow in the water, it picks up on foam and debris and bubbles and will show you the direction of movement of the water. Uh, another really cool tool, uh, another obvious rip current there. You can see the, the break uh, in the line of breaking waves, you know, which is classic for where, where the rip current is. The, the water's flowing out, the channel is deeper there. That's why the waves aren't breaking. So it, it will be very interesting to see what this sees at Holland uh, as we move through the course of the summer. And we're, we're obviously, the, the camera was in place and we're gonna go back and look and see what we can determine uh, what happened on June 6th when the, the two kids drowned there. So another, another version of what they're using, um, you know, some of the latest in research, this is tracking individual pixels in, in the video now. So the, the pink colors are water moving away from shore and, and that cyan green, greenish color is, is water moving toward the shore. So again, or it, it's picking up on this rip current really well. I'm, I'm interested to see what, what this will look like at Holland along the structure, because this current is obviously pretty strong on the ocean. You, know, it, you can see it moving out pretty clearly. The currents that occur along our piers in Western Lower Michigan or anywhere in the Great Lakes are also very strong. And I, I would defer to Dr. Meadows on, on that, and we can get into that in the discussion at the end, but the structural currents are, are very strong and, and you're not gonna be able to swim back to the shore against them. Um, so we'll see what, what these different techniques pick up at Holland as we move through the summer. So getting into you know, how things behave in the Great Lakes, and I'm, I'm focusing on Lake Michigan here, but this really applies to, to all the lakes. Uh, I'm speaking to all of them. Wave formation is really what it comes down to in the Great Lakes when we're, we're looking at rip currents and dangerous currents. Because when the, when the winds come up, the waves come up, and that's, that's when we get into dangerous conditions. So how are waves formed in the Great Lakes? It comes down to fetch length, which is how long the wind blows over the water. On Lake Michigan, it's 85 miles across by 307 miles long. So we have a big expanse where waves can, can build given that length uh, that the wind is blowing over it. How, how fast is the wind speed moving? We get into trouble on the Great Lakes when we get winds over 20 miles an hour. That's, that's about the, the range where waves start to build into the three to five foot range. And that's where we get a lot of our drownings. I'll touch on that in a minute. Wind duration, how long is the wind gonna to blow over the surface? If it's uh, a three hour wind, it's probably not gonna develop a very good wave field. The longer that it blows, the, the bigger that, that our waves develop into. And then the final factor is stability. In the springtime of the year, the, the lake, the air over the lake is very stable. Um, it's very cold. And, and when we get warm winds that blow over the lake out of the Southwest, they can't get down to the lake surface to build waves. They actually ride right over the top of that cold dome. Uh, it's, it's what gives rise to the, the term, the gales of November. That's a, the exact opposite thing. The air that's flowing into the Great Lakes you know, and, and driving big waves in the fall is cold. Cold air sinks, it's dense, and it, it digs into the lake surface a lot better and is much more effective in building waves. Um, so the, the stability part is, is another big factor uh, in building waves on the Great Lakes. So we, we are fetch limited, we're a closed basin, and all of our waves are developed locally. If you're standing out on the, the Pacific coast, you could be getting away from anywhere in the Pacific Ocean, and, and that's 
what's called swell. You know, there could be a local wind wave there, but a lot of what comes into the West Coast or any ocean coast is swell, which is waves that have propagated in from a distant wind. You know, so you could develop a really big wind across the Gulf of Alaska and those waves will propagate away and, and you know, potentially make it down to Seattle. Uh, it wasn't a local wind that developed that, it was a far away wind. And we don't get that on the Great Lakes because the wind and waves run into a shoreline really quickly. So essentially dangerous swimming conditions develop when, then the, when the wind rises and we develop waves. So the other thing to key on here is, is we don't have tides and we, like I'm telling you, we don't have swell. So without tides and swell, uh, dangerous swimming conditions really come down to one thing. How can we, how well can we forecast waves? And what Guy showed you in the, in the previous presentation is we're, we're pretty good at it. Uh, we're not perfect, uh, but, but we know the days when, when conditions are going to be bad and our models have gotten pretty, pretty good at it. So into the, the wave part of this, waves by themselves are a swim hazard. Like I said, you can see from this picture at Grand Haven that it's essentially a washing machine. It, it's a, chaotic swim state, uh, especially when you get near a pier. You have waves that are reflecting off the pier and bouncing back into the, the wave train that's coming in. Um, so the waves by themselves are, are a swim hazard. I, I, they wear you down. Uh, they're coming at you every three to five seconds, which is the typical wave period uh, all year long, but especially during the summer months. The other thing to, to look into here is where, where you have a breaking wave, you have you know some white water spilling, um, and that's really where we get into dangerous conditions. So that's something to think on how we can get that point across to the general public that when you see white water, it's it's pretty much game on for dangerous conditions. That means you've got waves at the three foot level. Um, below that, we don't have as many issues. When you get above three feet, that's that's where we have people drowning. And this slide shows it quite well. Megan Dod Dodson, my counterpart down in northern Indiana, uh, she's responsible for the southeast part of Lake Michigan, including to Buffalo, St. Joe, Michigan City. She has been putting this data database together for a long time. So we we've had hundreds of incidents since 2002 on the Great Lakes, and that's both uh, rescues and fatalities. You can see that by far the, the zone where we have trouble is when waves get into the three to six foot range. Below that, we have incidents, but it's it's a huge uh, number jump, three to six feet, and then it drops off after six feet. So most people outside of surfers and boogie boarders are not going in the water when waves are over their head. Uh, but a lot of people will give it a whirl at three to six. They they feel like this is fun. This is this is a wave pool. We can do this, and and they get into trouble. And so that's that's really something to focus on when the waves get over three feet you know, we, we have problems up through about six feet. So just to look at where, where these incidents occur in the Great Lakes, um, by far the downwind shores of the Great Lakes are a problem. If you look at Wisconsin compared to Southwest Lower Michigan, it's somewhat night and day. We live in the westerlies uh, in, in, in the Great Lakes and the upwind shore doesn't quite have the, the summertime con conditions that we do. So we have a lot of wind that's blowing from west to east across the lake. We get bigger waves. We have a lot, a lot of population in lower Michigan and, and we have drownings. And so some of the hot spots you can pick off is, I think it's Point Park up in Duluth between Superior and Duluth, a, a constant problem up there with rip currents. Marquette uh, has some issues along picnic rocks where a channel current forms. And then you can, I mean, you really pick out Southern Lake Michigan. By far, Lake Michigan has more drownings uh, than any other of the Great Lakes. So how do we predict waves? Uh, it really comes down to wind. We use high resolution wind models to feed into wave models. And that's, that's how we, we forecast waves on the Great Lakes. So the surface wind is what drives Great Lakes waves. And this, this is uh, showing an example of, of the three kilometer NAM model, which is one of our primary American models that we use. And this is kind of a classic setup where we get into trouble. It's typically with an advancing high pressure area out of the Northern Plains. Uh, most people think, well, that's gonna bring fair weather, we're all good, but it actually 
leads to channeling and funneling of the wind down the Lake Michigan shoreline. And, and we, we get into, I would say, probably three to five of these days every summer where the waves jump into the three to six foot range and, and we get into issues. And that's exactly what happened. This is an example from back in July of 18, but it's what happened on June 6th here a week ago with the drownings at Holland. So this is uh, the Wave Watch 3 model. The, the output on the, the right of the screen is, is what we see as forecasters here in-house at the Weather Service. Uh, it's showing one, two, and three foot waves on the northern part of the lake. On the left side of the screen, this is an unstructured grid, which means it's spider webbed across the lake. So as it encounters islands and shorelines, the, the points that we calculate waves on are increased. So we have more data you know, where it matters. It's, it's still a, a very high resolution model in the open water, but as we get towards shore, we're getting more and more data points in the wave model. Um, it, it is pretty much uh, a race car of a wave model. So if we feed it the right gas, meaning the right winds, we get the right waves out of it. So that's, that's what we do every day in the weather service is try to feed this model the right wind. Uh, if we get the right wind, the waves are dead on. Um, so what we then do with that data is translate that into swim risk. And over the years, we've, we have very much seen that you cross the three foot thresh, threshold and we have issues with, with you know, people getting into trouble swimming. So when we get waves into the three to five foot range, we start to issue beach hazard statements. Um, and that, that's essentially a, a beach hazard warning is what, what you could look at it. We're, we're letting you know that swimming is discouraged. Uh, it's, it's unsafe essentially when you get up into that three to five foot range. And you can find that forecast every day on our beach hazards website, which is on the, the bottom of the screen there. So looking at the last few slides here, looking into the Holland situation a little bit more. So the, the lay of the land of what goes on. Um, if I, I would be really curious as to how many people really understand what's going on when you walk onto a beach at Holland or Grand Haven to think about what's going on in three dimensions. So on that day on June 6, where, where two kids lost their lives, what was going on was we had a north flow on the lake, which means the winds were blowing unobstructed for over 150 miles. Waves built that afternoon to about five feet at, at the Holland area. So underneath the, the surface of the water, like Guy showed you up at Autrain, the sand is mobile. It, it's moving all the time. We have three sandbars. You, you can see them there. The, the first bar is pretty close to shore. The second one is just to the left of where I have longshore current. And the third one is out in the deep, way, way beyond where you would be swimming. Um, the darker the water, the deeper the water. The lighter the water, you know, the bottom is, is, is higher. So you can see what, what I see is four pretty good rip current channels. This, so this is an image off of Google Maps from probably somewhere in the last few years. But you can see four rip current channels near shore. So if you push enough water up on the beach and it can wash back out through those channels, you have ongoing rip currents. Um, on this day, though, I, I think probably the bigger factor going on was a, a strong longshore current out of the north. And if you've ever been, been to the beach, gone in the water, and you look up, and all of a sudden your chair is way down the beach, it's the longshore current that pushed you there. Um, on this day, on any kind of a north flow day at Holland, what happens is the longshore current is pushing you into a very strong structural current. So that water is moving down the shoreline for tens, if not hundreds of miles it hits that structure and has nowhere to go but straight out. And that's very strong, stronger than Olympic swimmers could swim back into. So if you're pushed off that first bar into the longshore current type channel there in between the first and second, and you're not a good swimmer, um, you're, you're probably going for a ride out the structural current. And you know your hope at that point is to try to get to the rocks of the pier. And then once, if you're beyond the pier, you're just treading water until somebody can get to you. So that's kind of the lay of the land. On top of all that, you've got waves coming in at every three to five seconds. So a little bit more on, on Holland. You know, they, any kind of a fetch, any kind of wind direction into Holland can lead to big waves. Uh, south of the South Pier, it's somewhat of a private beach. There aren't so many people swimming there. The, the main beach at Holland is, is Holland State Park. So the, the problematic flow there is out of the north and you can see at a direction of 343 degrees. So out of the, the, the north, northwest, you've got 160 miles of open water 
uh, into that beach. So the longer that the wind is moving over the water, uh, the bigger problems we get into Holland. The, the exact opposite is true at Grand Haven State Park. It's a southwest wind that provides problems at Grand Haven. At Grand Haven, the pier is even longer and, and the structural current is probably even stronger. So this is uh, a view of, of what I think the structural current looks like at, at Holland. This is from the Spyglass Condos uh, webcam. And we use this to essentially look for you know, dangerous conditions and we look for the structural current. So what you're seeing here is churned up sand in the water, uh, the, the brownish color. And we kind of use that as a tracer for where the structural current is. So on a north flow day, uh, moving into Holland State Park, the sand is being pushed down the shore. You can see it hit the pier structure, go straight out the structure and bend right around from the north flow. So that's, that's the type of ride that you would go on if you, you were on a float. Um, if you're swimming, uh, it's obviously very dangerous conditions. So another picture, different day. You know, notice the difference between the two piers. The the south pier, the one further up in the image to the to the left, is protected by the north pier. So you have waves that are smashing into the north pier, rising up onto the pier deck. Um, and this is the type of day where we, we get into problems at Holland all the time. North flow waves, you know, reflecting off the pier head there, back into the swim zone. Uh, the longshore current structural com combo is, is a problem. So I, I show this slide, you know, just to, we, we, I had an interview with Wood, Wood TV8 uh, nine years ago. You know, th this is kind of my, my frame of mind leading into this uh, event from a week ago where two kids drowned. I, I told the people in the interview nine years ago that we kind of know the days where people are going to drown because of the wave forecast. And nine years later, we still do. Uh, forecasts have gotten even better. Uh, so the question is, what do we do with this information? How are we getting this information to people? Uh, because there's there's somewhat of a disconnect there. So on June 6th, we, we have a buoy offshore of Port Sheldon, which is halfway between Grand Haven and Holland. This went in probably seven, eight years ago now. So this is a really good proxy for what's going on at Holland State Park. The buoy the winds peaked right around the time of the drowning at five o'clock, winds hit 26 miles an hour. And remember the, the bad zone in terms of wind is when we get upwards of 20. Uh, so we were solidly over 20 and that's the, the top left graphic, the bottom right graphic, significant wave height was up around four feet. So there's even more fetch into Holland from this buoy site. So I'm imagining that the, the waves were probably four plus with some of the maximum waves uh, over five feet. Um, and then that's not even taking into account the waves that are reflecting off the pier structure. So this is kind of, this fits the typical MO of, uh, of a drowning day at Holland. North winds greater than 20, three to six foot waves, sunny skies. And we would expect, you know, issues on a day like this. And unfortunately we got them. Uh, two people drowned that day, uh, a six year old and a 17 year old. Uh, one, I believe, uh, Ian Rowe was from the Grand Haven area. Uh, Christian is from Grand Rapids. So the question is, there's a there's a pretty good disconnect between the days we know are going to be bad. The graphic on the right is something that we put out at six in the morning that day. We issued a beach hazard statement. Um, so how can we do a better job? How can we get that information to folks better? So here's, here's my questions. This is the end of my presentation. You know, how can we more, more effectively message this? Are, are people using the beach hazard statement? You know, and one of the things um, that I wanna key on is how are we intercepting people with information before they head to the beach? What are they looking at? Um, when they get to the beach, what, what is kind of the screaming message in their face that this is a different day than other days? You know, even though the waves are up, what are, how are we interfacing with people? Um, should we be looking at more proactively closing piers and moving swimmers away from the piers? On that day at Holland, it would be my suggestion that we, people probably in a North Flow day shouldn't be swimming south of the beach house. Uh, same thing at, at Grand Haven on a Southwest Flow day, you know, people should be moved down the beach away from the pier. It, it's a bad place to be. Um, so I've got a lot of suggestions on the bottom of the screen. How do we start winning the lifeguard trend? 
Um, are our signs effective? So a lot of discussion here, Jamie, I guess I'll turn it back to you. Oh, that's fantastic, Duke. Thank you so much. Great job. Um, lots to think about. A um, lot of things that I've learned just since the last time I heard you present. So I know this is a lot for people that haven't heard you before. This is um, such great stuff, great questions. Um, I, Duke, let's have a round of applause in the chat room for Duke, by the way. <laughs> um, I know some questions have been coming in, some comments. Uh, Mark Breederland from Sea Grant is my co-host here and he's been moderating. Uh, Mark, you wanna throw out any uh, anything you've been seeing in there? Sure, there was a question uh, for Dr. Meadows about the buoy box data and maybe Bob can comment on this too. Is it available with a static URL rather than a dynamic URL source? Yeah, I can answer that. So essentially, what what guy is showing is is just our, our weather.gov website so if you go to weather.gov you know that will get you to a national map and then you click into the area anywhere in the country you want to go so if you want to click into western lower michigan that will get you to the grand rapids national weather service site and then if you click out over the water you will get what what guy calls a buoy in a box it's it's our point and click forecast and you can click anywhere in the great lakes move from office to office and get that same forecast Thanks. Thanks very much, Bob. Um, I guess uh, questions for Dr. Meadows. So guy, here's a few of them going to come at you so you can just go off on mute. And uh, um, what are the effects of fluctuating lake levels on nearshore wave dynamics? Assuming a grid network of buoys, um, how do numeric predictive models account for spatial autocorrelation? Is there a typical distance where there is a confidence is interpolated uh, between the data and the buoys? A lot, lot in that question, it looks like. Yeah, a lot in that question and a, and a very knowledgeable question. <clears throat> That's part of the reason that we've been driving the models to higher and higher resolution is to, to increase that correlation. So, you know, as Bob correctly said, the, the waves are, are spatially variable. They, they vary, you know, with fetch distance, with wind speed, and wind speeds are not constant over the water surface, they, they vary tremendously. So it's a very complex interaction that occurs. And these third generation models like WaveWatch 3 are, take all of that into account, including water depth, uh, and, and they are tremendous advances. So the point is, though, how do we, how do we translate that detailed data into actionable items uh, on the beach? So we can get a good forecast, as, as Bob indicated, our, our buoys show that the forecasts are, are tremendously accurate. Um, so we need to, to take that next step in terms of, of, of changing that into people's behaviors. And, and that's, that's the hard part. And we've tried a number of things over the last several years, but but to, to, to take those accurate forecasts them and turn it in, into reasonable understandings is, is an educational opportunity that we are all working on, but we need your advice uh, in the audience there as to, to how to make that more successful. Bob, another question came in that's uh, kind of directed at you and wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what's called machine learning and AI, so artificial intelligence, how are they involved in your forecasting? Yeah, <clears throat> right now they're, they're not a whole lot, but I, I think you know we're on the forefront of that technology and that would be more for my colleague, Greg Dusek uh, with NOS, um, that you know they're using it in a, in a post research type of sense, uh, it wouldn't be anything that I would be using in real time at this point. Thanks. Um, another question just came in for you, Bob. Are the beach hazard warnings limited to the Great Lakes? Question mark. Are there any plans to expand the map to other beaches around the country and do other softwares exist? So I, I was on a, a team that, that actually came up with the beach hazard statement about um, eight years ago now. So it, it was started, it was kind of three different efforts. One was my issue here in the Great Lakes where we have currents and waves. It's a, it's a multi-pronged issue as to why people are drowning. And we didn't wanna put out just a rip current statement because clearly we have other issues here in the Great Lakes. Uh, folks down in Florida use it for red tide type stuff, harmful algal blooms, 
uh, folks out on the West Coast use it for sneaker waves, which are long period swell. You know, they, they talk about out there never turning your back on the ocean because you don't know what the next wave is going to be like. And that's what they use it for. So it is used on the ocean coast uh, and it's used all throughout the Great Lakes. Um, for Dr. Meadows, I know several comments and questions came in about some of the high technology and lots of uh, impression about the sea dew with the serving equipment, but uh, kind of the focus was um, what equipment do you wish uh, folks would use if budget was not an issue in various places along the beaches? We've been doing a fair bit of work on autonomous systems. Um, and, and remote controlled systems since it's it's so hard to work in in the the rough seas of, of the Great Lakes uh, and these range from everything up to survey style vessels that that are able to work with no humans on board for for up to five days 24 hours a day for for remapping of the Great Lakes but there are also small versions of these types of, of vehicles that that could, you know, supplement life-saving equipment on beaches where, where you throw the little boat in the water and, and by little it's maybe five feet or so in, in length and it does the rescue. It goes out and can be directed towards the, the swimmer in, in danger, uh, has ropes to easily be hang, hung onto. It's powerful enough to, to drag a swimmer even through big waves and things like that. So, so these things exist. They're, they're, cost is is fairly high now at about ten thousand dollars a piece so it's not something that every beach can afford but but these types of systems that are under development and are maturing in their in their capabilities i think are are a real asset for 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 beaches um, and again uh, the old standby of having lifeguards is is a really good idea and always wearing your life jackets and, and know where the survival equipment is and all those things that, that are more common sense, but we all get excited when we're at the beach and we forget about some of those things. Well said, Guy. Um, while people are thinking of their final questions and comments, I'm gonna jump in here. We promised that each of these, we were going to share some water safety fundamentals. We're about fundamentals and innovation, but um, this is our water safety wheel. Um, that uh, Matt Gillen from the National Weather Service worked with us on along with um, Todd Marcy, but um, the life jacket, don't just bring it, wear it. That's our favorite expression. Um, you know, when you think back to the days when there weren't seat belts and now everybody's wearing seat belts, of course, they don't even think about it twice and how many lives that is saved. Same with bike helmets. We're seeing people in kayaks more and more wearing life jackets, but we're still not seeing it on boats. We're still not seeing it on stand-up paddle boards. Everybody should be wearing a life jacket when they're near the water because as we're hearing, things go wrong very quickly. We love the phrase to stay dry when waves are high. And we've seen in this session and previous sessions with the higher water levels, it's more dangerous than ever. Rip currents form. Uh, know before you go, check in with the weather forecast from Duke and others. Um, flip, float, and follow. If you do get in trouble, flip over onto your back to conserve energy, control panic float as long as you're floating you're you're alive and then follow the path of least resistance back to the shore swim to the side don't try to fight the current steer clear of the pier we talked about that break the grip of the rip again swimming to the side parallel to the shore and then back so those are some of, the, of our fundamentals um, we're going to um, also continue to offer our beach warning signs for those of you who run beaches at, and parks um, these warning signs are universal we've been testing them and they've got the QR code that'll take you to the page that Duke showed in his presentation with the current conditions, rip current warnings and so on. So every beach should have these so they're consistent. If everybody has all different signs, it's gonna be confusing. If everyone has consistent signs, it's less confusing and more effective, it starts to stick. Brochures, uh, I just got a call from the printer that these are done and we're gonna get them to the Sea Grant and they're gonna help distribute them. If you go to Michigan Sea Grant in their bookstore, they're gonna be available there for order, a minimum of 100. We don't want you to just order one for yourself. We want you to help distribute these. Um, our last version, we distributed more than 50,000 of them. We look to break that record with this next run with updated info. So, um, and on the inside of those, we have this new bonus brochure and our uh, poster inside, which is really fun. So the brochure opens up into a poster and, and um, we promised some surprises at these. So I am very happy to introduce um, 
someone who has been involved in the water safety movement um, for many, many years. It really took off more than 20 years ago after the drowning of a 12-year-old boy named Travis Brown near the top of Lake Michigan. Um, so joining us today is Travis's cousin, Katie Simsek. She's a member of our leadership team and my good friend. Um, Katie, would you like to say a few words? Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, as Jamie said, my name's Katie Simic. I got involved in water safety in 1998 when my cousin Travis drowned in Lake Michigan. Um, it was a beautiful summer day. And if anyone knows that the lake temperatures in Michigan normally don't start to get warm until mid July. So we were extremely lucky, had great weather, not so lucky because we lost my cousin that afternoon. Um, so from that, my grandparents decided that there if they could do anything, they would prevent drownings. Um, my grandpa left that afternoon and he said, we have to do something. He had never heard of a rip current. He was in his seventies when Travis drowned. Um, my grandmother grew up along Muskegon. So her grandparents had told her about what they called undertoes back in 1998. Um, when they made it their mission, they created the Mackinac County Water Safety Review Team, um, which we were lucky enough to have Guy Meadows involved in. Um, so today I'm here to, in, um, to present Guy with the Water Safety Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, it's the Wayne and Tony Brown Award. Yay. No. So Guy has been involved with water safety, um, with our family since 1998. He helped with predicting rip currents in the Great Lakes before the Weather Channel created the beach hazard warnings. He allowed us box placement along US-2 um, in high rip current areas to make sure that the boxes we were placing with safety devices were in the best locations. Um, he started with them in the late 90s and early 2000s, so we couldn't think of a better guy to receive the award. When my grandpa passed away last July, we were talking about this particular award as Ron Kinnanen had received it in the year prior. He, when we said, you know, who was the person that you thought was a water safety, you know, they had really done a lot with their career. My grandpa mentioned Guy's name multiple times. Without this discussion being between he and my uncle Mike, my uncle Mike, whose son was Travis and drowned in the Great Lakes, said, you know, I really hope Guy Meadows wins this award. The Lifetime Achievement's been a great award and we really want Guy to win. <laughs> so when we came back to the awards committee, Guy's name came up enough and we were extremely excited to present you Guy with the Water Safety Lifetime Achievement Award from Wayne and Tony and the awards committee from the Great Lakes Consortium. Oh, Katie, thank you so much. You, you have no idea how much this means to me. I love your family and all the years we spent together. Yeah, I'm doing the same thing. Sorry. <laughs> but I promised so myself I wouldn't cry, but I told Uncle Mike I wasn't making any promises. You know, we've been extremely lucky to have you all involved in this. And Guy, you've really, you know, you've pushed and made a lot of predictions and water safety very possible from your work. Well, thank you all sincerely. I really appreciate it. Say hello to all the family for me. I will. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Katie. Congratulations, Guy. Uh, big round of applause in the chat. Um, so well deserved. Real quick, I want to put in a promo for our next session, uh, jam number five, consecutive drownings in Great Lakes hotspots. I think this discussion about Holland is a great lead into that, and we'll have some more experts sharing uh, key learnings uh, from case studies from around the Great Lakes. And then we have a couple more after that about what every kid and their parents should know about water safety and then our bonus session on lifeguard programs, which comes up pretty consistently in these. Also want to thank our sponsors, uh, Coastal Management Program from Illinois DNR, uh, the Sea Grants from Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and Wisconsin, uh, Fast Star, and Well Street Beach. Thank you so much for your generosity. Uh, thanks to our many planners for both our unconference and these virtual uh, water safety jams. And thank you, uh, our, first of all, to our rock star presenters, Guy and Duke. One more round of applause for them. Amazing job. Great information. I can't wait to go back and watch it all again and absorb it even more and share it with more people. Um, but thank you to um, our many audience members. This was more than we've ever had before. 
Um, please join us next week. Help spread the word about these jams. We want to reach more people. Everybody should know all of this and continue to support us um, on our action committees uh, by donating, sponsoring, and letting others know about us. So that's what I have for you. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And we'll do a follow-up survey. We'll do some reminders about the future ones. And thank you again to our presenters, to our committee, and to all of you for joining us. Great job. Thank you.